Welcome to 3ABN's Camp Meeting 2014, The Second Coming, an in-depth look. Hello and welcome to 3ABN's 2014 Spring Camp Meeting. This is another one of our big themed events in the whole weekend. We are talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. I can't think of anything more important to talk about. And we're very excited to have all of you here. And I just want to say to you, good morning. And we're just hopeful that you are ready. I know you had your cups filled yesterday, but we're hopeful that you've got a little more room because we've got a lot more that's coming. This morning, we're going to have James Rafferty as our speaker. And James is the speaker and co-director of Light Bears Ministry. I'll bet you all are familiar with him. Have you seen their new program that James and Ty and the ministry is doing called Table Talk? It is one of the favorites for most people. We get lots of wonderful comments on that. James also uh, has program on Books of the Book. But James early on recognized the call of God on his life to go out and preach the good news of Christ crucified, of the risen and exalted Savior. And he has had the opportunity, I'm going to read this, he has um, been sharing the incomparable love of Jesus in Africa, Asia, Europe, the Middle East, Australia, and all over America. And in addition to his preaching, he also does seminars for, on the books of Daniel and Revelation. So we're very, very excited. His message today will be the apparent delay. But first, we're going to have Celestine Berry and her husband, Michael, come. Michael is so talented on the piano, and Celestine is an anointed singer, and she's going to be singing The Power of the Cross. Cool. 
I'm assuming that you're clapping because I'm here, <laughs> not because of anything else. But you understand that it's important for a preacher to have a good, good illustration for his sermon. <laughs> Especially one that is somewhat relaxing to the audience and gets us ready for. Let's open our Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3. As we begin, I've heard some very good reports about camp meetings so far, and I'm very blessed to be part of this opportunity to look into one of the most fundamental truths of the Bible, the second coming. And of course, my presentation this morning, the time that we're going to be spend this, been spending this morning in the Word of God has to do with the apparent delay. And there's different ways that you can interpret that title. I didn't choose the title. It was, it was given to me. But one of the ways that we can understand that title is the apparent delay. It's not really a delay. It's just an apparent delay. And I think that that's part of what I'm going to try to emphasize here as we look into these Bible verses that talk about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Because I believe that God's purposes know no haste and no delay. Those are his purposes. And so we need to ask the question in the context of that, what are his purposes in relation to or as they relate to the second coming of Jesus Christ? And I'd like to just pause for another moment and have another word of prayer with you as we open God's word. Father, we're just thankful this morning Thank you. for the opportunity Thank to open you. your word. We want to pause and just ask for the blessing of your Holy Spirit. You promised that to us, to each one of us individually, and perhaps even more so to us collectively as we draw together and seek to study. Father, we just want to pray that 
our hearts, our minds will be in tune with heaven, that we will give your Holy Spirit an opportunity to teach us. I pray personally and individually that you will cleanse my heart, my thoughts, that I will be a channel just to communicate your truth, your word, and I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Second Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 1, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye, verse 2, may be mindful of the words which were spoken before that by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles, of the Lord and Savior. Verse 3, 2 Peter 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days. Do you believe we're living in the last days? Yes. So we're going to now find out what the Bible says is going to come in the last days. That would be an indication or a confirmation that we're living in the last days. The first word here that we read is that there will come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying... Verse 4, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Where's the promise of his coming? And it, and it indicates in this verse and in the context of the second epistle of Peter, it indicates that, that these people are somewhat believers or Christians or followers because they're, they're calling it a promise. And in the context of this, Peter warns about those who are departing from the faith, who are turning from the holy commandment once delivered unto them, who have known the Lord but have turned away from the power of His salvation, from the grace of God. That's the context of Second Peter. And then he goes on to say this, verse 5, For this they willingly, willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. And I would just want to summarize there that they're willingly ignorant of this one thing, and that is the word of God. The word of God. That's going to be our focus for understanding the apparent delay. There are a number of prophecies in the Bible that talk about or predict or point to the second coming of Jesus Christ. It seems as though every writer of the Bible has a little something to give us about the second coming of Jesus. I think we're very familiar perhaps with the book of Revelation. That is the inspired writings that were given to John about the second coming of Jesus Christ, about prophecy and end time events. But John was not the only apostle, not the only disciple that wrote about the second coming. Matthew had a whole chapter in Matthew 24 about the second coming of Jesus. Mark also had a whole chapter that, that was designated in Mark 13. And Luke wasn't left out of the picture. He had an entire chapter in Luke 21. And we find Paul talking about the second coming in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And each one of these writers was inspired to give us a little something that helps us to answer the question, why the apparent delay? The one I want to look at first, because we're actually going to conclude with 2 Peter, is found in Matthew 24. And it's not going to be much different from Mark 13 or from Luke 21. All of these eschat eschatological or end-time event chapters are very similar. Some of them have a little bit of detail that isn't in the other. But we'll look at Matthew 24 just to understand this one reason or this one point that's being made here in Matthew. You may be familiar with the fact that Matthew 24 gives us a layout of events that were to take place prior to the destruction of Jerusalem and then repeated prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ or the end of the world. It's what we call a dual prophecy. Now, we don't see that in Daniel and we don't see that in Revelation. It's unique to Matthew and Mark 13 and Luke 21. Because the disciples asked Jesus, what will be the end of these things, the, the, the temple where one, not one stone will be left upon another, and 
the sign of your coming and the end of the world. And so Jesus mixes the events, mixes the signs that lead to both of the events. He mixes them together. And so when we read Matthew 24, we see, we note that all of these signs in the first few verses leading up to verses 14 and onward, all of them were fulfilled just before the destruction of Jerusalem. And they will be repeated just before the second coming of Jesus Christ. But there's one sign that I want you to look at with me specifically, and this sign is found in verse 14. It answers the question more directly, why the apparent delay? Verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall what? The end come. Why the apparent delay? Because according to Matthew 24 and verse 14, the gospel hasn't been preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. If you were to take all of the signs in Matthew 24 and put it in one side of a scale, the wars and rumors of wars, we've seen that, nation rising against nation, famines, pestilence, natural disasters like earthquake in different places. If you were to put all of those signs on one side of a scale and you would put one sign, the one sign, in Matthew 24 and verse 14, the gospel being preached as a witness to all nations on the other side of the scale, you know what would happen to that scale? It would tip this way. Because this one sign in Matthew 24 and verse 14 outweighs all the others. All of these other signs can be fulfilled, but if this one sign isn't fulfilled, guess what? Jesus is not coming. Why? We're going to see this more when we look at 2 Peter, when we go back to 2 Peter, but I'll just tell you that one of the reasons why, probably the most important reason why, is because God doesn't want anyone to be lost. Amen. He wants every single person possible to be in heaven, Amen. and therefore it is vital that the gospel goes to every nation before Jesus returns, so everyone has an opportunity. Now, Paul says that in his day, the gospel was preached to every creature under heaven. It is possible. And sometimes we think, well, you know, statistically, it doesn't look like it's going to happen. Well, the Bible is not based on man's statistics, is it? I don't even want to hear about how long it would take at our present rate to reach every country and to reach every person and to reach every kindred and nation. I don't want to even hear about that. Twelve men didn't base their preaching on that when they took the gospel to the entire world. Of course, it was not just the twelve, but of those whom God called through them. And we ought not to base our thinking on that either because God can finish us up just like that. So what is the context of Matthew 24 and verse 14. What is it that's causing the delay? Well, I want you to look with me in the context of these verses. Just go back a little bit to verse 9. It says, then, and that word then infers what's gone before. Then, when all of these wars and rumors of wars and all of this pestilence and famine and earthquake, all these natural disasters, when they increase with intensity and frequency like a woman in birth pains, a woman giving birth to a child, more intense and more frequent, more intense and more frequent. Have we seen that taking place? I was a little nervous about traveling out here. I was in Maryland at the General Conference just before I came out here, and I was checking the weather reports. <laughs> and I heard about this extreme weather and what was taking place in the Midwest, and I thought, I wonder if that's going to be in Illinois. I wonder if I really should be going out there. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. And I thought, no, this is, a this is a divine appointment, just like I thought when I was driving here this morning. <laughs> this, is, this is a divine appointment, and God is going to get me there on time. In fact, Shelly told me, she said, now, there's construction on the freeway, and there's construction in West Frankfurt, and there's construction on the last part of the highway they're coming through, and sometimes we have to wait 10 minutes, and sometimes we have to wait 15 minutes. Did you get delayed in any of that destruction? I said, no, God took me right through it all. I don't know if they were taking a lunch break or they just hadn't shown up yet or what was going on, but I just went straight through. And I believe that this is a divine appointment. In fact, it was really interesting because on the way over here, God was giving me part of the sermon. He was saying, okay, James, I know you've got it all prepared, but I'd like you to digress just a little bit. I want you to share this and this and this and this. And I said, okay, 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 okay. And I was ready for Dee to call me and say, James, you're too late. We found someone else to preach. And I was going to say, that's not possible because God has given me a message. Amen. 
so I can't not preach. <laughs> so just sing another song and I'll be there. <laughs> and this is the message. The message is, because I was going to spend the whole time in 2 Peter 3, that the context of Matthew 24 and verse 14 is a time when you are hated of all nations for my name's sake. Then should they deliver you up to be afflicted, verse 9 says, and they shall kill you, and you will be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Not only that, but then in that time, verse 10, many will be offended and shall betray one another and hate one another. The church will look like it's about to fall. It doesn't fall. Company after company is going to go out. Our test will be to gather warmth from the coldness of others. Many false, prophecy, false prophets, verse 11, will rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, verse 12, the love of many will wax cold. But he that endures until the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel will be preached as a witness. That's the context. The context is not the present time, not the ease and prosperity that the church is experiencing right now where we send out missionaries, you know, on these little 10-day visits and these two-week visits and these three-week visits to, to India and to Africa. And, you know, we struggle and we wrestle with, you know, the, the living in these different conditions, but we're all doing it for the Lord. and It's really a good thing and it's a blessing to us and it's a blessing to others. That's all good. But the time we're talking about here is a time when that becomes the reality that never ends. When there's no more cushy bed and there's no more luxury car and there's no more clean, nice clothes and there's no more uh, adulations and applause and kudos because, you know, you went out there to India and you braved it for a few weeks and, and you won souls to Jesus. When people hate you because you're preaching the gospel, they don't love you. They don't like what you're doing at all. When it looks like the church has vanished... When we don't have anyone to, to pat us on the shoulder and say, good job. When we're just doing it because Amen. of Him. Amen. And our focus is on Jesus. Are we ready for this time? I have to say honestly that I'm not. It's very difficult for me to be in a situation where I don't have nice accommodations, especially at my age. I know, this audience <laughs> thinks that's funny. And by the way, <laughs> just so you know, don't tell him that I told you this, but today is Ty's birthday. <laughs> I'm 51. And I can't tell you how old he is, because he wouldn't like me to tell you that. But today, Ty and I are the same age. <laughs> what? <laughs> now, I'll be 52 in a month, so we are only the same age for about a month. I've been preaching for 30 years. And I feel, I feel different than I used to feel when I was a kid. And if you think I still look young, you should imagine what, you can only imagine what people used to think 30 years ago when I get up to preach. They're like, what's that kid doing up there? <laughs> but I know that I'm not ready. I'm reminded of that when I'm inconvenienced. I'm reminded of that when, when I have a difficult time because I'm not appreciated as I think I should be. Hatred? of the world, love waxing cold, nobody appreciating, everyone opposing, being considered by the world as a terrorist of some kind, the enemy of everyone, and being able to preach the gospel as a witness, having a love that doesn't wax cold. Why the apparent delay? Well, you know why and I know why. We know in our heart of hearts, we know when we look in the mirror, we know when we face the reality of who we are, we know why the apparent delay. Because this one sign outweighs all the others. And we're not ready. God is so merciful, isn't he? Amen. We talk about all the signs that are taking place in the world. We, we, we know it's becoming more intense and more intense and more frequent and more frequent. And somehow, we want to be ready. 
We want to be motivated. But none of that is really going to motivate us, at least not as we need to be motivated. Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 14, the only thing that can actually motivate us, and he says it's the love of Christ. The love of Christ compels us or motivates us. That and only that can take us through because it's that love that will not grow cold, will not wax cold when the whole world hates us. Why the apparent delay? Well, 2 Peter was written back in the day, 2,000 years ago, and Paul in 2 Thessalonians tells us about this apparent delay and why this apparent delay would be. He talks here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 about the second coming of Jesus. He says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our, by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind. Verse 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Or troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Don't be troubled about this. Don't be shaken about this. The Thessalonians were shaken. They were troubled. They, they struggled to understand what was going on. Paul had written them an epistle that seemed to indicate in chapter 4 that some of them would be remaining until the coming of Jesus. Some had fallen asleep and some would remain. Those of us who remain will, will, will caught up with them in the air to meet the Lord. And they were wondering, why, why, why? And I'm, I'm thinking that these words and this situation is so applicable to us, some of us who may be second, third, fourth, or fifth generation Adventists. Why the delay? Why the delay? Why the apparent delay? And Paul says, well, wait a minute. Don't be shaken. Don't be troubled in spirit. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there be a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, we could spend a lot of time on these verses. We're not going to because we really need to get back to 2 Peter chapter 3. But just in passing, we need to recognize that this man of sin lines up with Daniel's prophecy, specifically Daniel chapter 7, and Revelation's prophecy, specifically Revelation chapter 13. And we know that from Paul's time until the time of the end, this power ruled for 1260 years. And we also know that a wound was inflicted which was to be healed and he was to be restored to power. And we see that taking place right now, more and more. A deadly wound takes some time to heal. And it is, point by point, steadily increasing in the healing process. So Paul tells us instructively that there are these prophecies that are to be fulfilled. There are these time prophecies leading to certain events that are going to transpire in relation to this man of sin power that is going to be reestablished in the earth in the end of time. So it's not just about us. It's also about Bible prophecy. But in the context of both of those, there's a conflict taking place. Because one of the things that this power is doing is in concert with a couple of other powers on planet Earth, is seeking to undermine the message of the everlasting gospel, to block it, if you will, to hinder it, to stop it. This power does it in many ways. It sets up counterfeits. Or it works through the world to get our minds distracted and focused on other things other than Jesus Christ. It would, in fact, enjoy it if we would just focus on this power. Talk about this power. Identify this power. Spend all of our time just directing people to the wonder of this power. Because it says the world will wonder after this power. And in the process, know everything about this, codenamed Babylon, and lose sight of Jesus. That's why it's so important for us to recognize that when Matthew 24, 14 is fulfilled in the context of Revelation, it takes first place. We see this in two ways. In Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6, the everlasting gospel, Matthew 24, verse 14, is preached to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people with what kind of voice? 
a loud voice. In Revelation chapter 14 and verse 8, the second angel's message follows and announces the fall of Babylon in what kind of voice? No. Read the text. There's no loud voice. The first angel is given in a loud voice, the first angel's message. The second angel's message doesn't have the loud voice. There's no loud voice on the second angel's message. The fall of Babylon is not given with a loud voice because the fall of Babylon doesn't take the precedence of a loud voice. The gospel does. Preach the gospel with a loud voice. And then the second reason is because the first angel goes first. Not the second angel. We do not preach the fall of Babylon with a loud voice. We preach the gospel with a loud voice. And we preach the gospel first because the gospel is the only thing that can bring Babylon down. The second angel is waiting for the first angel. The second angel is waiting for the first angel to preach the everlasting gospel. Preach that everlasting gospel with a loud voice and I'll follow you. And I will announce the fall of Babylon because Babylon will fall when the gospel is preached. We could spend a lot of time focusing on Babylon and we can never bring it down because it is so intricate and so detailed we'll never be able to figure out everything about Babylon. But if we will focus on the gospel, the everlasting gospel, and preach that with a loud voice, it will bring Babylon down. Guaranteed. And so in 2 Peter, we have this powerful admonition. And I love it. Because it's reminding us that there's only one thing that we are ignorant of in the context of understanding the second coming of Jesus Christ. Willingly ignorant of the Word of God, which to me is powerful. 30 years ago, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Many of you know that I was not a Seventh-day Adventist at that point. I had been raised a Catholic And I accepted Christ and was not affiliated with any church, but began attending the Calvary Chapel Church because the person who introduced me to the sinner's prayer was going to Calvary Chapel. Shortly after that, I was also attending a Pentecostal church. Going to both of these churches, one on Sunday and one on Wednesday with a youth group, I was introduced to Adventism through my sister, who was studying with Adventists. And immediately, as she began to share with me some of the unique teachings of Adventists, like the idea of going to church on Saturday instead of Sunday, my concern led me to study with Adventists to get my sister out of the church. Not to get in the church, but to get out. My mother was also concerned, being a Roman Catholic, Irish, that my sister was joining a cult. In her mind, anything that wasn't Roman Catholic was a cult. And so I, as her brother, my mother was living in England at the time, it was my duty to get her out of this church. And I did everything I could to get her out with my mother's help, with help from my friends in the Pentecostal church and my friends in Calvary Chapel, with everything on my side to get my sister out except for this, the Word of God. With all of those motives tending to pull my sister out of the Adventist church, there was only one thing that was working to put me in the Adventist church, and that was the Word of God. For this one thing they are willingly ignorant of, willingly in the sense that they know better, they ought to know better, and that is the power of the Word of God, the creative power of the Word of God, to create in us a clean heart to renew in us a right spirit, to convert us from the inside out. And you may say, well, I've fallen, well, I've failed, well, I've been an Adventist, I just haven't lived up to. Stop focusing on yourself for just a moment and get your focus back on the Word of God. I recently watched a video of a young runner by the name of Heather Dornadin. She was running in a 600-meter relay in 2008 at a Big Ten conference track meet for Minnesota. She was a favorite to win. There were four runners in the race. One was her fellow teammate and two others. And as they went around the lap, the first lap, the runner behind her, she was in first place, caught 
her heel, and immediately she went down. She fell hard, cut her face, but in an instant, she popped up again, back on her feet. Now, she was well behind the runners in front of her who had not lost their pace. They were way ahead, but as she jumped up, she picked up her pace and she began to run and run and run. And in a short time, she caught up with the last person. As they were coming around the corner for the last stretch, she caught up with the second person. And as they came to the finish line, she passed the first person and won the race. Now, it would have been something for her if she would have just won the race. Just if she would have won, that would have been amazing. Just to win the race. But the fact that she fell and still won the race... Now that is something else. Don't focus on the fall. Don't focus on the failure. Don't focus on what you haven't done. Get your focus on Jesus, the author and the finisher. Run with patience the race that is set before you. Looking under Jesus, the author and the finisher. And what will happen then will be greater. (laughs) Just like it was for Heather. An inspiration for us all. A just man falls, Proverbs 24, verse 16, seven times and rises up again. It's not in the falling, it's in the rising. And when you fall beneath the billows of this world, reach out that hand for Jesus and say, Lord, save me or I perish, and he will be there for you. Don't be ignorant of the power of the word of God whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, verse 7, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, verse 8, be not ignorant of this one thing. And here is where we're just going to finish up our focus on the apparent delay. We're just going to spend the rest of our time right here in these next two verses, primarily. Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. Now, before we finish that verse, though some of you may have already, I want to ask a question that will help us to understand what follows. Be not ignorant of this one thing. What is is the implication there? Wouldn't it be that there's something that we could possibly, possibly be ignorant of? something that isn't in the forefront of our brain, something that we don't think about often, something that Peter has a burden for. I want you to remember this. I don't want you to forget this. Don't be ignorant of this. Don't not know this. Know this. Understand it. Let it be in the forefront of your brain. This is really important. This is really significant. I'm talking here about Bible prophecy. Context of 2 Peter, more sure word of prophecy. Where you do well that you take heed. That's 1 Peter chapter 1. Context of first of, of second Peter, excuse me, second Peter chapter one. Context of second Peter, present truth. This is present truth. The only place in the Bible that present truth is ever mentioned is second Peter chapter one and verse twelve. Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. And by the way, the context of what we need to be in remembrance of is God's love and forgiveness. And the context, again, following it is Bible prophecy. Don't be, don't be negligent of this. Don't be ignorant of this. What is following is huge. It's big. It's important. It's significant. Are you ready for it now? Are you ready for it now? Okay. Be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. There it is. That's it. I don't know how that fits into Bible prophecy. I know a day for a year, prophetic time, but I'm not sure how this, where this fits, how this applies, and how significant it is in our, in our prophetic timelines. But it is important because Peter said it was. I don't know how it helps us to understand the apparent delay. I don't even know if anyone ever preaches on this verse. If you've ever heard a sermon on this verse. But for some reason, Peter is telling us that this verse is very significant. 
Don't be ignorant of it. That with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. We're all familiar with the different time zones in the United States, aren't we? We have Eastern Standard Time and Central Pacific Time and, or Standard Time and, and Pacific Standard Time. I live in Pacific Standard Time, and so I have a difficult time when I get over to Eastern Standard Time or Central Standard Time or Australian Standard Time when I'm way off kilter. But have you ever heard of the time zone that could be characterized as eternal standard time? <laughs> eternal standard time. Peter is telling us here that in eternity, when you live forever, when there's never any end to anything, when it just goes on and on and on and on, when a million years turns into a billion years, turns into a trillion years, turns into a million years, turns into a zillion years, turns into a Googleplex, and then eternity is just beginning. In that time, a thousand years goes by, and it's just like one day in that time. Don't, don't be ignorant of this. You think that Jesus has been gone for a long time. But you're not living in eternity. You're living on this earth. And when I was a kid, it took a long time to get to double digits. <laughs> and it seemed like it took even longer to get to be 16 years old and get my driver's license. And from there to 18 was just like taking eternity. And then to 21, oh man, the days were just going by so slowly. And then once I got to 21, I was like, Whoo, here I am, 51 years old, <laughs> just like it was yesterday. <laughs> Nothing to it. Oh, I hear some of you say, oh, to be 51 again, right? <laughs> but that is insignificant. When you get into eternity, a thousand years goes by and it's like one day, 24 hours. Which means, if you think about it, if we could live for a hundred years, let's just say we could. We exercise, we eat our veggie dogs, we drink our soy milk. I like rice milk, but... And we get to a hundred years, a hundred years. In eternal time, 100 years, based on 24 hours equals a thousand years, would be equivalent to two hours hours and 24 minutes in eternal time. Two hours and 24 minutes. So let's just say we're all granted 100 years. Some of us have an hour left. Half an hour left. Some of us have a couple hours left. But 2.4 hours in the context of eternity. Don't be ignorant of this. Don't be ignorant of this. When Jesus says repeatedly in the book of Revelation, behold, I come quickly, behold, I come quickly, we say, wow, what did he mean by that? Well, he meant what he said, but he was speaking in eternal time. Peter's talking about the second coming here. He's talking about the second coming. This isn't taken out of context. He's saying, listen, don't be ignorant of this. Remember this with God in heaven. A thousand years is like a day. So Jesus didn't say, I'll be back in 2,000 years. He said, I'll be back in two days. Two days. I'll be back in two days. I'm coming quickly. I'll be back in a couple of days. The Bible admonishes us. We need to sit in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. We need to think about this from heavenly realities. God's purposes know no haste and no delay. So when I was a brand new Christian and accepted Christ as my Savior, and then became a Seventh-day Adventist. What else can you do if you're going to follow this? What else could I do? I was in love with Jesus. He'd forgiven me for all of my sins. I accepted him as my personal Savior. And then I was confronted with the truth and the reality of the Sabbath, which I thought was always Sunday. But then the Bible showed me verse after verse after verse. And there it was, time and time again, in the Bible, clear, in prophecy, in example, in Christ's life, in every way, shape, and form. There it was. And then that final verse where Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. I said, well, I love Jesus because he first loved me. So it was just wasn't even an issue. And I remember the first time I got up in front of that Adventist congregation, I was giving my testimony and sharing. And this was my verse, 2 Peter 3, verse 9. This was my verse. This was the verse 
that God gave to me 30 years ago as a new believer in his second coming. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Will all come to repentance? No. Unfortunately, they won't. And it will break his heart. He will wipe away our tears. Who will wipe away his tears? There will be an empty space in his heart for all eternity because he has graven us upon the palms of his hands. He is not slack concerning his promise. And I remember telling the congregation in Spokane, Washington in 1984, this is the verse that God shared with me. He's been waiting for me. And I'm so glad he waited for me. Brand new believer, so glad he waited for me. There are thousands, yea, maybe millions, that God is waiting for that are going to be so thankful for this verse. They're going to be so thankful for the long suffering of God. Amen. They're waiting. And God is waiting. What is he looking for? Well, according to Matthew 24, he's looking for people who keep their focus on Jesus, who spend all of their time directing their attention to him. According to Revelation 14, they follow the Lamb wherever he goes. I long by the Spirit of God to be part of that people. My flesh doesn't long for it. My flesh pulls me in other directions, but the Spirit of God is willing, though my flesh is weak. I want to be part of that people. And I know as I follow Jesus, he's going to direct me to witness and share and do the things that he wants me to do and live the way that he wants me to live. But my needs, the vital key for success in my experience is to keep my focus on Jesus. And Satan does everything he can to sever that connection, to break up, to pull me away from that focus. Because he knows that when we have that focus, when we see the heart of God, we recognize his longing for the world, that we will be, verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto or hastening the day, as the Greek actually says. Hastening the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, verse 13, look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. I've got one of these new contraptions. It's new for me. You know, at my age, you have a hard time adapting to stuff like this. But it works. It works. And I like it from time to time. It becomes handy. My Bible is wearing out, and I'm very loath to exchange it. I've had this Bible for 30 years, and I've got it all marked up. But more than that, I know where the verses are. I may not know the chapter and the, the, the verse, but I know where they are. <laughs> <laughs> it's the left side of the page. It's the top part. Of, I know where they are. And I can't find another Bible just like this one that has the verses in the same pet place. So I'm loath to give it up at my age because I know where they are. And I want to be familiar with my Bible. And the thing that I recognize in this context is that when verse 10, the day of the Lord comes... And it's going to come as a thief in the night. That's what it says here. It says the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. But it doesn't say that the Lord will come as a thief in the night. The verse doesn't say that. 
It says the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. But the Lord's not coming as a thief because when he comes, we're going to know it. But the day, that day is going to be a surprise to a lot of people. But in that day, the heavens are going to be, are going to pass away with great noise and the elements are going to melt with fervent heat and the earth also and the works that are, that are therein are going to be burned up. God is long suffering with us because he knows what the day of the Lord is going to bring. As W.W. W. Prescott said in his sermons in Armadale, Australia, in 1895, in that day, God's people cry unto him for deliverance. But he seems to put off the day of delivering them because we shall have come to that time when the deliverance of God's people means the death of our adversaries. The deliverance of God's people from their foes can only be followed by the coming of the Lord Jesus and the destruction of their enemies. God is slow to pour out his wrath upon those who have rejected him. And he seems almost to have deserted his people, but God will avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. Do you understand what he's saying here? There is in God's heart this struggle that he has. He loves his people. He wants to deliver his people. But he knows delivering us means the end of our enemies, his children. Children of wrath, but children nonetheless. You know how that is, don't you, parents, grandparents? You know how that is to have a wandering son or daughter or granddaughter someone that you love, adopted or real, connected, biological. You know how that is to be concerned for their future, for their eternity, for wanting to do anything and everything to reach them, for wanting time to stand still so it doesn't come to an end. That's the heart of God. And yet we're told, and we know this, that there is coming a day when Jesus will say, it's finished. It's done. But he will only say that because as he looks out upon this world, he can say, he that is holy will be holy still, and he that is righteous will be righteous still, and he that is filthy will be filthy still, and he that is unrighteous will be unrighteous still. Nothing will make a difference. Not another year, not another month, not another week, not another day, not another moment. Everyone has made a decision for or against me. It's time to close it up. There's no reason for sin and pain and evil and suffering to continue on. I need to close this up. But that can only come when this gospel, we're told in Revelation 18, lightens the whole earth with the glory of God, Amen. with the character of God, with the heart of God, with who He is, with how He feels about all of us. Oh, thou that from eternity upon thy wounded heart has borne each pang and cry of misery wherewith our human hearts are torn, Thy love upon the grievous cross doth glow the beacon light of time, forever sharing pain and loss with every man in every clime. How vast, how vast thy sacrifice, as ages come and ages go, still waiting till it shall suffice to draw the last cold heart and slow. That's why the delay. God is long-suffering toward us. He is not willing that any would perish. He wants everyone, all, to come to repentance. So we could sum it up this way. We could say, from a biblical perspective, that God has been waiting and is waiting because, number one, there are developments that need to take place in Bible prophecy. Always have been. And as we follow the, the projection of Bible prophecies, we follow the timelines of Bible prophecies, we follow the fulfillment of Bible prophecies, we know why it is we're still here. Number two, God is waiting for us. He wants us to be ready. He wants us to be prepared to be His witnesses, to share His truth. Number three, God is reluctant to destroy even the children of wrath. He longs for them to be saved. 
He longs for one more sinner, one more person to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, to believe in the gift that has been given to them in Jesus Christ. And then to sum it all up, we must remember, we must not be ignorant of this one thing. With God, in eternal time, a day, it's like a thousand years. A thousand years, it's like a day. It's an apparent delay, but Jesus is coming quickly. And in eternity, when I am a thousand and fifty-one years old, when I am a million and fifty-one years old, when I am a billion and fifty-one years old, when I am a decillion and fifty-one years old, when I am a Googleplex and fifty-one years old, I'm going to look back on this earth and I'm going to say, wow, a week of sin and evil and pain and misery. Six thousand years, six days. A week of sin and pain and misery. Don't even remember it. It's forgotten. Not even worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we want to thank you this morning for helping us to understand the reasons for the apparent delay, for reminding us not to be ignorant of this one truth, this one reality, that you are indeed coming quickly and that you are reluctant to punish those who have rejected you, to give them the ultimate consequence of what they are choosing, death. That you are long-suffering to us, would not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance, and that you want to use us, your people, as a witness in a time when love waxes cold and hatred prevails toward us, and that we're now in the quarry, the testing time. Not just loose, idle rocks in the quarry, but, but rocks that, that feel the hammer and the chisel. Father, bring us through a shining light.